Hello there, and welcome to our live stream. I'm Agil, your host. Uh, Ravi will be along in a minute. But as you know, warrior, uh, merchant, storyteller, and roomcaster. And I haven't the slightest idea at the moment what we're going to be talking about. But Frag is busy at the moment and will be coming on line soon. As I say, we'd love to hear from you at any time. We're always glad for your comments. And don't forget to subscribe as you've been shown on numerous occasions. And uh, we hope to have a good debate today about various things and other. And uh, he hasn't actually got your comments up online yet, but I'm sure he will do. And as you can see, I'm filling in for the moment. So what have I been doing? Well, I've been waiting for having a smart meter installed inside my house. It's partially successful as I'm still, I need a new boiler. The weather itself changed a lot since yesterday when it was bright and sunny and now we've had splashes of rain, hence we're indoors. Uh, promises to be uh, a bit better later on. But as I say, I mean, we will be covering uh, various topics. Uh, one of my own particular ones, which we'll be covering later, is good old Queen Athelflaed, who came to Derby and booted the Vikings out of Derby. And a uh, very interesting uh, character, surprisingly little written. I know I've got one book about her, uh, the Lady Who Fought the Vikings. And I think we underestimate the effect or the influence that she had. Uh, she could have been a queen in her own right, but she didn't because uh, her father, King Alfred, wanted a united Britain, United Kingdom. And she was called Lady of the Mercians, a title that was newly invented. And following the plans that had been drawn up between her and her father, and a brother, Edward the Elder, they moved forward on the Vikings. Like I say, we will be doing this uh, in greater depth later on, but at the moment, I just thought we'd give you a little taster. So, unfortunately, there's very little um, that we know of the actual battle in Derby. I tried to work out the route that she came. So, you know, Derby today is, it's a city. But there's some interesting bits about it. It's got a great history. Um, there's um, Armen Alley down the side of the cathedral. That's where the money is used to hang out and make coins. Iron Gate, we know to be um, a Viking. Iron Gata. Gata is the Norse for street. So Iron Gate means Iron Street. Sadler Gate. Now, St Mary's Gate, I think that's under some uh, scrutiny because we think it's possibly later than the Norse period. The marketplace where the war memorial is, that's a good contender as well for Viking Age. The very name Derby means farm of yeah. the deer. And Northworthy, well that was the name before then. But history of Derby goes way, way back to the Celts. And it's called Devenju, meaning place abounding in oaks. And then we have Deventio when the Romans came, <coughs> Parker's Peace in Derby, big square of grass. That was the site of a very high status building. Some say it's a villa. I don't know. Nobody really knows. The fortifications around there, we know through excavation, were refortified in the, about the 10th century, which makes sense with Athelflaed's invasion. Uh, there were two forts in Derby, like I say, um, near Parker's Peace is one, the other is a bit further up. And if you look along the river, there's a darker green patch, and that's where they used to haul all the goods across the river. Uh, there are the sides of the Roman road left, and if you look enough, St Mary's Chapel uh, is on the bridge. And if you look closely, it looks like slate, but it's not. It's Roman brickwork. And what that's all about is, if you're a wealthy person, so you didn't stay too long in purgatory and went to heaven, you built a church. Well, that's all well and good if you're a wealthy person. Well, what do you do if you're a farmer? Well, 
on their ground, they would have Roman ruins. Today, we'd be digging them up. In the early medieval period, of course, there would be freestanding structures. So I thought, well, give them a bit of this Roman building and help build the church. And it helped them uh, towards, as they saw, their salvation. If you look at St Mary's uh, Chapel Bridge, you'll see that. And if you look at St Werber's, again, you'll see these ready tiles. Once you know what you're looking for, they stand out. Um, okay, so now we have the Romans, and then, of course, the Saxons came. Now, Derby's changed quite considerably since uh, the Saxon period. There's a lot more rivers there than people see today. Ford Street, for instance, that was got barges going up and down until about 1930. The Wardwick, which is the oldest part of Derby that we know of, which is uh, 6th century, it means Valdesvica, or Walders Dairy Farm. And that whole road right up to Mark Eaton Park was a river. It's been paved over. Uh, this was illustrated about six or seven years ago. A, a lorry fell through outside the bank uh, near St Peter Street, fell straight through. And there was vaults in there from the 16th, 17th century. We also were fortunate to get some very early tram lines from there as well. Uh, but it was a lot of money to do it, but you wouldn't know now looking at it. And also, for those of you who come to Derby, Nero's coffee shop underneath that was one of the early prisons. The jail cells are still there, and the reason they moved it on was because when the river flooded, like, you know, heavy rainstorm, all the prisoners got drowned, which they thought was very bad sport when they could hang them. It then moved up to Agar Street, second jail, built in 1790, and is an excellent, when it's open, it's owned by Richard Felix, who has a police museum in there as well. Well worth a visit if you can. And uh, you could see there the death cell, the debtor's cell, and you can go for a spooky night out with them as well. By 1800, uh, they built a bigger jail on Vernon Street, and it looks like the front of an American jail, and that's because that's exactly what it was. They copied the style of the American fort. And in 1833, uh, you had the Reform Act, and as a result, they built two towers either side with firing sh uh, slots, and it covers the whole street. In fact, there was a riot in Derby in 1833, and a man was shot in Vernon Street. This is extra wide to accommodate the crowds for the public hangings. Uh, it's very just part of what life was then in those days. Uh, hanging, hanging day was a day out. And indeed you get crowds, maybe two, three thousand, just to watch. Especially if it was a notorious criminal, then it would be really crowded. And you get people peddling there, selling hot pies, dolls. You get pickpockets, you get um, ladies of uh, ill repute would be there. Maybe even gentlemen of ill repute, you know. And if you look from the gate of the jail, you'll see houses at the end of Vernon Street. And these were hired out uh, for a pound a day. You could uh, sit there and then another pound you'd buy a, a monocular from Lancaster and Thorpe. And you could watch the proceedings without being hassled. The hanging is, there's a lot of strange, what we would think of as strange things. We brought out, they loved, the crowd loved it if the person being hanged confessed. It was printed in a broadsheet, sold for a penny. They'd be hanged. And now, hanging was a slow process. You were choked. So your friends would come, hang onto your legs and try and snap your neck. This is where you get the phrase, pull the other one. Once the person was dead, they were left to hang. And the women would then come forward and they would touch the goiter, any goiters they had with the dead man's hand. And when you die, of course, all your bodily fluids come out, shoot out of you. And they would dip the handkerchiefs in that. They would wipe, again, any blemishes because they believed it would cure them. And 
they would take little splinters from the gallows. Again, these were seen as talismans against illness. The body was then cut down. The rope was sold off, penny an inch. And that's where we get money for old rope. They would then be taken to the local tavern and everybody would rush up there and with a penny you could buy a pint of gin and you tested it by putting your knife in in the gin if it started to bubble you didn't drink it very powerful stuff and you'd sit there and you'd watch while the doctor came in his coat would be covered in filth that showed he's an eminent surgeon and he would dissect the body bit by bit and you'd sit there and say what's that yellow wobbly bit that's the spleen oh look a gallstone i'll keep that and they would dissect the body head to toe and you'd do that and you'd watch that and uh, thank, thank the lucky stars that you weren't the one and this went on not just in Derby, it went to all kinds of in any town so the evidence we've got left today is this down the side of the cathedral opposite Armin Alley you'll see a tombstone uh, for uh, Mr. Simpson and you'll see there his whole family are buried there. Mr. Simpson uh, is Derby's longest serving jailer, 30 odd years and he doesn't get the credit. Um, but being a jailer in the 18th, early 19th century was a, a different job. You paid to get that job, something like 60 pounds a year. However, it's not just you get paid but if you're a prisoner going in, you get paid for you, you you had to pay to go in. You had to pay for your chains. If you didn't want one, you had to pay for that. If you want food, fine, pay for it. If you want a drink, pay for it. You maybe want some comfort at night, pay for it. So everything you did, you paid for, which would go in the jailer's pocket. You then say, look, Miss Simpson, I'm broke, I can't afford it. You go on a sliding scale, which of course you'd have to pay for. And you paid to get out. When you served your sentence, it was the equivalent today of 20p. So it's, that's how he made his money. That's just how it was in those days. It's a very profitable job. Um, hangings themselves changed a lot through the period. Early on, you could if you were um, a relative of the victim of a murder you would pay you could pay to hang hang on the rope to help kill it or you got paid five shilling a lot of people went on the rope to pull the murderer out later on you get the traditional you know the 13 hitches and you choke slowly to death 20 minutes was average then you get the short uh, drop and the rope would be tied up and your weight would be calculated and as you dropped it snapped your neck very humane way of doing it unless of course you've got the weight wrong a big chap needs less drop than a, a little chap and if you've got a long drop it will pull your head off uh, this happened a couple of times well, not to the same person obviously but to the same executioner uh, interesting fact peer point who, the whole family was famous for being executioners but the last peer point didn't agree with the death penalty and was actually strongly ag against it um, very interesting man his autobiography is fascinating reading so that's crime and punishment I mean they weren't you weren't automatically hanged if you stole over four shilling 20p yeah you're gonna get hanged other things painting your face black, pulling up ornamental trees, sheep stealing obviously, highway robbery, horse stealing. It was from about 1780 to about 1800 was called the time of the bloody code. There were 200 capital uh, crimes at that particular time. Uh, they toned it down a bit. Later on uh, it became transportation to the colonies either America, Canada or of course Australia, New Zealand um, but prison wasn't uh, a thing in the early 18th sorry early 19th late 18th century it was a place where you were held 
until judgment or punishment is meted out. And punishments, uh, they date way back, even to the Viking times. Some of the punishments, um, you could be hanged, obviously. Pressed. Now, this is a, a difficult one because you could, you had to get a, uh, a confession either of guilty, not guilty. If you didn't, then they couldn't charge you one way or the other. And a way of getting out of that is elect to be judged, uh, judged by the church. This is 18th century. And what you did was you didn't say anything. So, the go it, the why do that? Well, you might get off with a prison sentence rather than a death sentence. And if you were hanged, then all your stuff went to your family instead of the um, law. So what they would do, oh, bag is back. So what they would do, they would lay you down with a stone yeah. in the small of your back. They would put a, a, a plank on top of you and put weights on. And as a result of doing this, they would say, I have to press you for an answer. And the first day you were allowed water that come out of the sewer, basically. And the next day you were allowed dry bread. I think the record was 40 days. Uh, in Derby, there was a case. They said, how do you plead, sir? No answer. Put the weights on him. Come on now, what do you want? I want an answer. No answer. And they kept on and on, and there was a blood and guts everywhere. And I thought, oh, well, never mind. And this bloke came down the street and said, and they said, what are you doing? They'd just been pressing this guy, trying to get an answer. He says, well, he's deaf and dumb. Uh-oh. And that was the last pressing that we know of in Derby. Probably in Press England. Yeah, he was just pressing to get a confession out of people. Oh. So, yeah, that was one of the punishments. Now, imagine Bragi. Uh, this is in the 18th century. Right? Oh, right, yeah. Uh, you start giving it, oh yeah, I was a, you wanted to be a servant. Um, but you'd been involved in a case and you'd found to be telling lies. So what they do, they get your right hand, that way up, they brand it oh. with an L. Okay, now, when you go to court, you have to say, I swear by Almighty God, it's got a great big L. So the judge will say, this guy's a liar. So nobody ever believes anything he says from now on. So I may want to go to a job for the manuals. I'm the best carpenter you've ever seen, blah, blah, blah. Take your glove off. Okay. Both of them. Now show me your hands. All right. Pop it, mate. You're a liar. That was one. Uh, Cromwell had a peculiar one where he bored people's tongues through with hot... Uh, Oof. That it was hurt. Yeah, it was quite, well, by today's standard, by Bob... Barbaric? I was going to say Bear Barrick. Bear Barrick. Bear Barrick. Oh, it's the same only in the Bear nude. Barrick. I think I know him. Yeah. It's the same <laughs> as only here in the nude. So, oh. it's, but if you look at it in the context of the times, everybody's living in, well, not everybody, majority of people are living in very harsh conditions. You've got rushes on the floor, rats, you've got water leaking in, you're not getting enough food. So it's got to be worse than what you've got, otherwise it's uh, more of a holiday. If I reverse the camera, we can see any comments being left. Yeah. So anyway, that's a bit about crime and punishment. Brog is back. I am back for a few minutes. Okay, let's have a look and see what's going on. That's better. We can yeah. now see who's watching and we can also see any comments coming through. So hello. Yeah. Welcome if you're watching to this live stream. As you know, I am Braggy and this is Eggle. Yeah, and I've been boring you about uh, crime and punishment in Derby. Now, we've been filming today and uh, what have you been filming, Eggle? Well, we took two sagas. Yes. Um, we, were, we did a folk uh, story. We were going to do something about axes, but unfortunately, the rains came. Yes, it did start raining. We also did a bit of foraging. Yes, we did uh, a short video on foraging in the dark ages. I've still got a black blackberry seed in I, my I know, teeth. To do get your teeth blackberry yeah. seeds, it's uh, most strange. Yeah, annoying. I've still yeah. got it in there. But hey ho, life is. Well, they have strawberries. Yeah, and loganberries. Loganberries, you forget them. They're lovely, don't they? I know. And Loganberry yeah. wine's nice. Well, also, I mean, you've got them. Little wild strawberries. Wild strawberries. Oh. Yeah, They're I like love old strawberries. Old-time strawberries. Yeah, are. that's them. Um, when I was a kid, living at Wengroves Hall, we used to get loganberries. 
but we never told anybody because we used to eat them rather than <laughs> tell anybody. But, uh, we it's told funny, them funny what you do at school. Yeah, well, but uh, yeah, as I said, foraging was good fun. Uh, I was telling people I had a meter put in. Oh, right, yeah, Not your meter. Not made in the flat. No, you don't want to put it in yourself, do you? Where would you put it? Oh, I don't know. I can think of a number of places. But apart from that, uh, I'm start here's things. I'm starting a diet on Monday. Oh, right. I'm going to get my blood sugar down and my weight down. Well, if we do some more combat, we'll soon lose some weight. Well, also, <laughs> if we keep a, a weight uh, log, yeah. Uh, let me see whether I'm going the right way or not. Well, yeah, if we could have this updated each week in the vlog series, couldn't we? Yeah. That would be excellent. I'll just listen out in case my, well, my brother's around at the moment, just yeah. downstairs looking after my father. So, if I have to go, that's where I'm yeah. going to. It's the perils of being a full-time carer. Yeah, we're caring. Cyril deserves it. But it's the same thing, but I've got some comments here. Oh, it's a guild of green men and wood rose. Good luck on the diet, he says. Thank you. Was hail to you. Yeah. Uh, one of our great Saxon friends, not a Viking. <laughs> yeah, well, Saxons, <laughs> they're uh, good friends of ours, and uh, one day I hope to go to Virginia and see them. Oh, we all do. We'll do yeah. a world grand tour. Mm. You know, Iceland, mm. Sweden, Denmark, America, Virginia. Grimsby. Grimsby. Well, I've got to go to Grimsby. No, but I, I like, you know, the, the, it's a, yeah, it's a personal thing as regards religion. I'd love to see them. Because that just reminded me of the folk tale of... Uh, a Grim and the Merman of Grimsey Island. All right. It's so a good one, that. You've got that one on Yeah, you? I know that one yeah. off by heart. So I, I, once I told a folk tale, I generally don't forget them. Well, I'm the opposite. I tell them, yeah. and then it's just wiped. It's like the old videotape. Well, you, you should try to retain them, because, you know, there's always potential of going out telling to people. No, because then when I relearn them, I tell them completely differently. Yeah. I thought you were going to do a live stream telling my folk tales at some point, yeah. ones yeah. I can remember. Yeah. But that's when we'll be doing more solo and individual live streams. Mm. As we're both not used to it yet. It, well, it takes we're getting, time. We're getting there. I mean, what with personal issues on each side. Yeah, we've had a, a difficult and... couple of weeks trying yeah. to get together to film and to commit to live streaming. And we do mm. want to commit to live streaming because it does make a large portion of the content mm. on YouTube. And people want live streams. Mm. Yeah. Well, I can see the point, but as I say, I mean, We'll do what we can. Yeah, but, well, uh, you know, if we can film more in the future and we meet up a bit more regularly, then um, we can do more. Sort of stick it in there. That will be the uh, metal glass thing for the war chest. I was going to say. Yeah, well, as long as it's not sticking on top of the board, you're all right. Uh, I'm, I'm the drawing of AMO with that one. So, uh, has anybody got any questions they want to ask us? No, I can't see no questions and I can't see it on my TV at the moment. So normally I'd have my TV on another channel uh, so I can watch. I can hear movement downstairs. Okay. So you take over, I'll carry on in a minute. Take okay. Back. Right, so it's, as you see, Baggy's, um, Braggy's had to leave. He's uh, here in movement down there. So let's have a look and see what we can have a look at. How off with the grey five boroughs? Yeah. And review of Valhalla Rising. Well, that's an interesting film. I like to think of it as the first pagan film out. Uh, the story basically is there's a, a slave called One-Eye who is hired out as a fighter. People are betting on him and eventually he escapes killing his uh, captors. And he befriends a boy. And they're wandering through presumably Scotland because they people they meet are Scottish and they are supposed to be going to find um, a kingdom uh, a, um, set up where they can be kings. Well, they cross, as it turns out, the Atlantic and land and make landfall in America. And they all sat there and strange things start happening. One eye can see into the future. Now the point I'm trying to make is, this man sees everything, even his own death. Um, but he would rather see, go, experience his own death like that, and go to Valhalla, than just negate everything and just getting away from it all. I've oversimplified it, but it, it's quite an interesting uh, story. If you forget that some of the swords are totally out of period, but I mean, that's just, just ignore that. But it's the way people are cast. And it's 
It also makes you wonder what the inhabitants of America at the time, Native Americans, thought. Who are these people? Um, yeah. So it's worth watching. It is very gory. If you have children, perhaps it's not a good idea. There is a disemboweling scene in it, which is pretty graphic. But, yeah. And it's whether it's factual or not it doesn't really matter it's just a good film now I'm also looking at the content list here the Battle of Branabra um, interesting King Athelstan who was the first Regir Anglorum King of England and he grew up with my heroine Athelflaed more about that in another time and he again was trying to have a united kingdom which included scotland he fought his way up and actually got king constantine of the scots to swear um, fealty to him uh, there are a couple of comments i can't read them at the moment because i don't have glasses when braggy comes back we'll read them now they were still singing from the fact that uh, Athelflaed had booted them out of the, the Vikings out of uh, Derby and Leicester and they wanted revenge and the Viking called Sil Silky Beard teamed up with Constantine and they were gonna kill Athelstan. Athelstan was seen to be dithering, he was waiting, he got his army together and they attacked but still nothing happening and eventually Athelstan moved he was a patient man he was getting on a bit and if you look at the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles you will see he absolutely trounced them he killed King Constantine half the Viking fleet had to be left behind because of the many deaths and he sorted them out but good now we don't know where this actually took place. We know it was a big battle. And ironically, it's very strange that uh, you see the sites of battles. One thing was the Kudel Horde, which was a massive, about the size of this, this uh, chest, full of silver, silver coins, silver ingots, hack silver. And what we think that was, was part of the pay for the Viking army but of course, people got slaughtered, they couldn't carry it back, so they buried it. It was found around 1840. Parts of it are in uh, the museum in Liverpool. Um, a very impressive bit, and I, I guess the rest is in the British Museum. But it goes to show the great wealth that was there. But, as I say, Athelstan, he was the first king of all England. Now, my character... Egil Thorson. Well, it's based off Egil Skallagrimson. Grimson. Egil Skala Grimson was a friend of Athelstan. Um, he presented Egil with a shield, and Athelstan had a famous sword called Quenbita, Quenbita, and it's said that he could got a millstone, he'd hack it in half with his sword. I wouldn't advise you doing that personally, because it would uh, damage the edge of you of a good sword, but. Apparently, it would didn't have no ill effects. So that virtually kicked the wind out of the Vikings for a number of years. And by this time, of course, people were mixing together as time moves on. They do they become the English rather than Norse or Saxon or whatever. So, yeah, you know. It was a significant battle. It was as significant then as the First and Second World War is in the 20th century to us today. So, yeah. So, I'm looking down here at this board to see what else we've got. Uh, it's very difficult because normally I wear glasses. Eccles Dig Series. Goddess Freya. We did that today. I've put an armor. Well, there's a lot there, but unfortunately, we need each other to do this. 
Um, so, you know, I mean, the Vikings and the Saxons, yeah, as I said earlier on about Derby, um, it was a frontier town. If you like, if for our American friends, if you compare Derby with, say, Kansas or Wichita, these are places that were border towns. It's where young men went to make a living. It's where spies were. It's warriors would go because you've got to go from Danelaw into Wessex. And, yeah, you, you'd have a turnover of people. There would only be a few, say, 200 people uh, living there permanently. But you'd a lot of more people going through, either going through or, or going back up to York. So... Yeah, uh, a turbulent place indeed. It's a bit more quiet now, of course, but in the 18th century, it had its own miniature sort of industrialization. I don't know whether you know it, but Derby um, had its first factory there. It's possibly the oldest factory in the world. It uh, was about 1700, 1702. It was a silk spinning mill uh, owned by Thomas Cotchett. Uh, the problem they had with the silk was they couldn't, to weave it properly, it has to be circular. And this was more like D shaped. John Long was the manager of the. Uh, ah, he's back again. Back again. We've got some comments. I can't. Uh, the, they've been up. If you have a look, we can see what Yeah, I have like. to look at my TV, but I don't want yeah. my TV or computer on. We won't ignore you. No. Thanks for your comments. I can go through your comments and put them yeah. in the comments reading video. Yeah. So. Well, I'm on about the uh, silk mill at Derby. Oh, the silk mill. What, the pub or the place? The pub. <laughs> well, the, the, the actual factory. Well, um, John Lom actually went to Piedmont and stole the idea of weaving silk. Had he been caught, he'd have been hanged. Now, he brought back with him a guy called Guy Trevally and the Italian woman, and they came back. Now, conveniently, John Lom was dead oh. in a couple of years. Now, Most unfortunate, then. Very convenient, because his uncle got £150,000. A lot of money knighthood. in those days. Yeah, and a knighthood. And at the time, Lom was making £80 a week but he wasn't paying the river authorities. So, so waited for him to die. Now, what happened was he died over a number of weeks in a great deal of pain. And even at the time, they suspected poison. The favoured poison was arsenic. It was called inheritance powder. Oh, yeah, get it from yew trees. Now, what you do is, this is prior to the marsh test, leave the body in the ground, year later, dig it up, if it's still sound, you've got poisoning. That sounds like a folk tale I told recently, mm. called the, the corpse that would not rot from Iceland. Well, anyway, John Lom's body was taken round Derby and buried. year later, they said, where's his body? Don't know, Gough, can't find it. You know how it is. Well, cheers. They hadn't found his body, and we don't know to this day where it is. It's probably next to Joseph White's body that they've found. However, <laughs> however, if they found the body, you could have proven whether that was arsenic poisoning. Well, of course so, yes. Now, the Italian woman was arrested. Now, bear in mind, she was foreign, she was a woman and a Catholic. Three things you didn't want to be in 18th century Derby, or anywhere in 18th century England. But she was released through lack of evidence. And then, surprise, surprise, Gar Chivalli mm -hmm. opens a mill. Ah. This it didn't succeed, but the point is he opened a mill. Now, I smell a rat. Also, the government was involved because Lom on his way back was chased by the Italian Navy, or what was it, the Italian States? Well, it's not really a Navy, is it? Italian. <laughs> and smack into the Royal Navy. So that is a diplomatic incident has to be dealt with and it's convenient that he possibly dies now you may think i'm to talking a load of rubbish i can only go on the evidence and i invite people to have a look at that and see what's going on 
The mill is now a museum. I worked there for 10 years when it was the industrial museum. It's now a little different. They're doing it up. Oh, you own it's forge. <laughs> yeah, well, they have. Draghi here owns a forge along with some uh, lots of equipment. Putty. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, no, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Private joke. Um, oh, poor Midland. Yeah, well, made him laugh at work, I tell you. But having said that, you know, it, uh, if you come to Derby, go down the side, you'll see some arches. They are the original arches for the original museum. Uh, Mill. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, if you come to Derby, perhaps we could do a meet-up. Well, yeah, I can always do a tour of Derby and yeah. show it. But, uh, well, Bragg is back, so I can... can no, let's talk, you're talking about the 18th century. What would have been known in the 18th century in Derby about Viking Derby? It depends. Derby itself was... Um, you had some of the high ups in the Lunar Society, Erasmus Darwin, you know where the... Oh, yes. Yeah, in the marketplace, there's the tourist information. Yes. That's where Erasmus Darwin lived. You had um, the watchmaker... Oh... Um, Smith? Yeah, he was uh, Whitehurst. Whitehurst, yeah. Whitehurst Smith was the third generation. Yeah, yeah. And he was not only a superb watchmaker, he was the. Uh, he discovered that the earth looked like lasagna in various layers. Um, he also became aware of the king's money. You also had Joseph Wright, the famous artist who hung around mm, with him. Could be related to me. Yeah. <laughs> and of course we had. Dr. Johnson, who oh yes, it's noticeable once he got married at St. Werber's Church, he nipped off pretty quickly when Erasmus Darwin came because Erasmus Darwin was a darn sight cleverer. He eventually went to Litchfield. Well, they both did, but the Lunar Society was a collection of gentlemen exploring science and technology, and. We even had such uh, visitors as Benjamin Franklin. Oh, yes, he here. came. A couple uh, of times, didn't he? Yeah, Thomas Jefferson yes. came. Um, in fact, Benjamin Franklin was big friends with Whitehurst. Uh, an American told me, and um, I'm only repeating what he said, because we nobody really knows, but he did his famous experiment with a kite, with a key, that he's supposed to have done that at Derby. I don't know whether he did or didn't. If you did, great. If, if you, you know, please leave yeah. a comment. Benjamin Franklin, as I say, was um, instrumental in American independence. For those of you who know the works of Joseph Wright, if you look at lecturer of the Orrery, those are gentlemen of Derby who supported the American Revolution. Um, when you think about it, it makes sense. You know, you can't blame them for getting up tea they'll pay him up taxes and not allowed to represent themselves and let's face it you know how are you going to administer a massive country like America from London if they don't want to well, be it's a heck of a job well it's like you know it's the old old story you make more friends it's easier to make friends than it is to well keep your friends problem. close or your enemies closer yeah. <laughs> so the same well, I think a um, good job that we are friends with America. Otherwise. Oh, yeah, I love Americans. Yeah, we'll be talking. We'll be talking German otherwise. Well, well if, if the American Civil War was, you know, if the British went in, then America would now be five or six countries. Mm. So, you know, it's yeah. it's funny how one little thing can change history. Yes, but it changes, and that's the way it is. But uh, yeah, so I mean, Derby itself, as I say, has had a rich history. Uh, and it's still making history today. Well, of course, so. Of course, we're making history yeah. in Derby. <laughs> well, I was thinking more of Toyota. And, well, uh, yes. Not Egel and Yeah, yeah. I mean, hopefully we'll be. In no, we will not I don't believe in the word yeah. hope. We will. <laughs> yeah. And also, of course, the um, earth removing people. You are uh, not you, Clinton. What? Well, uh, JCB. JCB. And don't forget Rolls Royce. You mean there? Must have been in Derby. Definitely. We're we'll talking about Derbyshire. Uh, uh, one thing I'm not talking about Derbyshire is Blue John. Oh yeah. And most people, you know, you may be saying to yourself now, well, Braggy, what is Blue John? Well, Blue John is a precious stone. And it's only found in Derbyshire, as far as I know. And, or strangely enough, they were digging in the ruins of Rome. Yes. Them, 
And they found a massive bowl of blue jug. Yes, and it makes you think whether the Vikings and the Saxons knew of this stone and whether they mined for it, because you know, previously the Romans would have mined mm. uh, very heavily. In fact. Well, we haven't, as far as I know, and I'll stand corrected, we haven't found any blue Johnny Viking contact. No. What it's we do that. find is a lot of jet. Yes, jet's very popular. Yeah, and um, trilobites. Mm. Oh, yes. Been made into necklaces. Um, and sea stones. Oh, in fact, I'm wearing one. Yeah, you got one up there. Yeah. You've got a whole load of them outside. I, I do have a load hanging yeah. up. They're meant to be in your good look. Yeah. And, of course, that's why they wore them. So... Yeah, uh, as for actual Blue John, I know of Roman examples. Romans definitely use Blue John. And it's running out because. It's running out. Yeah, now you can't. We used to get things like that. Now it's a lot smaller, and they'll even glue pieces together to get the uh, size they but, need. But you know, you, you could imagine a Viking or a Saxon finding yeah. some Blue John and working it into a bead, you know, or. Well, the thing with Blue John bin. is, I have a book on it at home for a change. And you could tell which mine it's from by the story. Yes, I, I believe that. Yeah. I used to be a caver, so I know a lot about uh, this. The, uh, a speedologist, well, as he's called call them. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Blue John's very interesting. There's a cave up Derbyshire with a massive pillar of Blue John, wow. but they can't take it out because it will bring the cave down. Uh, so that's worth a lot of money. And certainly in quarries in Derbyshire, you can go along, you still find it in the cliff faces, small bits. I've got a bit yeah. of it. Yeah. I've, got, I've got a bit of Blue John over here, I think. Is it Blue John? Well, it's weird they call it Blue John and yet it's a ready purple colour, isn't it, really? Well, purple John sounds a bit weird, I suppose. Well, I did have a bit. That'd but be an interesting thing. Where do they get the name Blue John from? That's it. Here Here's a bit of Blue John. As you can see, rather than being blue, it's purple. Hold it to the camera a bit closer. Go on. And this is a, a very natural product of Derbyshire. And it only occurs in Derbyshire in the whole world. And I'm, I'm surprised there's no context yet with Vikings and Saxons being for it. It may well be. I expect uh, that will happen in time. Yeah. You'd think they'd be on crosses and things like that. There's some you? else you could talk about. Amber. Amber. Now, Amber, this is, it's not actually a stone. What Amber is, is fossilised tree sap. There we go. And those of you who uh, uh, know about Jurassic Park, is a mosquito set in uh, amber. Well, you can get frogs of all sorts. You can indeed. Can be worth a lot of money. And the whole thing, there's even a room in Russia uh, that they had called the Amber Room. Yes, because, I've heard of this. Uh, some say it's, well, the Nazis took it, but whether they destroyed it or buried it, we don't That's know. That's lost, isn't it? Yeah. It, uh, oh, I take those Sagers. I Allegedly, so. Blue John is from the French Blue June, which wow. means blue yellow. Yes, I think I have read that before. Well, that's fair enough. So, uh, luckily, I got to see that message long enough to read it. Yeah, it's, uh, that's good to know that because you know, I often wondered about that. Where was it? Oh, South. Now, um, what's it called again? Blue, uh, uh, amber. Amber is. Was it a very tradable commodity? Alright, I'm getting up. Okay. You carry on. Especially in the Viking Age. Bye, Bragg, you see in a bit. And amber was used in necklaces and various other bits of jewellery. And uh, so popular it became that around the Baltic coast you have the Teutonic Knights. And they took it upon themselves to say, we own all the amber that's found. And there were barrels and barrels and barrels of amber, which of course they made a lot of money at. If you took amber without the Teutonic Knights' permission, they would kill you. That's how important it was to them. Today you can buy necklaces of amber. They're very expensive. The ones with the flies in and the creatures are more expensive. But you have to be careful. Uh, some say if you put it in salt water, it floats. We'll see, I can't remember, but it's the best test is if you get a lighter and a pin, get it red hot and then touch it. If it goes in to the amber, it's plastic. If it, you could tell plastic when you heat it up. So that's amber, it's very important. Uh, we have, if you go to Jorvik, you'll find amulets made of amber. Uh, as I say, we haven't found Blue John yet, but it doesn't mean to say that they haven't 
weren't aware of it. I mean, it was a commodity like everything else. But jewellery as a whole, has, um, as you can see here, I'm dressed up to the nines. And it's rather like the travelling people. You showed your wealth by what you were wearing. You dressed your wife up in the finest and yourself. Now, if you look at my necklace here, one bead yeah, would be looked on as a rich man's wage for a week. Shows I'm very wealthy. And beads, as I say, were very... Glass itself was looked on as semi-precious. You have to be careful when you make them because the fumes could kill you. So they would be outdoors. Now, beads are very useful because you could tell by certain colours, like this orange one, what period they're from and in your wig especially it illustrates it best of all because of the uh, way vikings lived you left a layer of detritus bones pots human excrement the lot and if you can imagine a multi-layer chocolate cake and it can be up to 15 feet deep each layer is a generation of people's detritus so you go through each one <coughs> and we found orange beads were only around about the 8th, 9th century. They weren't before or weren't after. Fashion. It's like everything else. It's a fashion. But you learn from each period. Now, you heard me talk about excrement. Excrement is a fascinating subject. I was lucky enough to be taught by Dr. Jo Bone Jones. The thing about excrement is you learn so much about people's diets and possible life habits. Bragi's back in town. I'm so, back. I'm talking about excrement. Oh! So what... Dung. Yeah, so you talk about that. What's so great about it? Well, we break it down with acid. If it smells really bad, usually it's human. But you can look in there. Now, you learn about the types of food people ate. Apples, for instance, were about that big. Yes, yeah, so I was surprised by that. And you ate the whole lot. Plums and sloes, you ate the whole lot. Mm. Now, there are Plum certain sauce. things you can digest and certain things you can't, like today, tomatoes, um, sweet corn, and various other things. Well, they didn't have sweet corn. No, exactly. But we know they had cherries, and we know that they had apples, because the stones have got mouse teeth marks on. So they passed the relevant bits and then mice and rats had a go at it because not everything they ate was digested well, of course so now an interesting thing uh, dr jones wanted to know if you ate a fish skeleton how much of it would be absorbed and he was looking very volunteer because you'd have to eat the fish and the skeleton and then pass it and go through the aforementioned mess Guess what? Nobody volunteered, so he did it himself. Carrying this bucket around with him. By the way, the answer is 10%. 10, 10%. I've got a bucket here. Yeah, and his was a plastic one. Oh. <laughs> but he realised that, the, and we go a lot to Dr. Jones. Nice one out there. Bones Jones. Yeah. What a legend. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you stories about it. But 10% of the skeleton is absorbed by the body. He also analysed, you know, the old question, where do flies go in winter? Well, they die and end up in the eaves of your house. Yeah, that makes sense. He found beetles, flies and everything else. And he was also the only person, I think, in Europe to have the jaw of a lamprey, which is a baby eel. And he got that set in perspex. Oh. And if you ever go, if you ever this his lecture, go to it. It's the best fun you'll have in two, two hours. Well, it'd be great to get them on the channel one day when we're big and sort of successful on YouTube and have well, millions of viewers. Anybody who wants to see Bone Jones, uh, go to York and there's an exhibition called Dig. And yes, he, I've seen that. Yeah, he runs that. He's a jolly gentleman with a bow tie. Well, if you ever go to York, perhaps you can contact him and we can go and do a little more interview with him. Um, you know. He, I have known Bone Jones since '87. And he still doesn't know my name. Well, he knows of me. That's and, funny, that. Yeah. I, it, no, if you met him, you'd understand. I was um, having some beer with somebody the other day, I don't know his name. Yeah. 
no, he's a great man. He used, he used to do folk dancing. You know where they do the oh, oh Star yeah. of David? He used to do that. But, uh, that just reminds nice. me what my dad said in the hospital when he said, is it you don't like? And he said, Morris dancers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I quite like them. Well, there you go. It makes you think our old Morris dancers, yeah. you know. Well, that goes way back to Celtic times, if not before. Mm. There you are some that. explanations, but uh, yeah. Well, that's another video. Mm. But another place, you're well worth a visit. So, over to you, Bragi. Yes. So, what can we talk about next? Well, I don't know. Many things have come to mind. Let's have a look on the board. Yeah. Let's have got navigation in the Viking ah, Age. I can help you there. And, and I've still got to make a navigation device so we can make a video that of That is this. a popular one that they said. It was a song Yes. Uh, Ah, uh, there is. Going through. There are, hang on. People are actually uh, challenging that. I'm a Morris dancer. Oh, but, oh. Yeah, good. Superb. Yeah. No, now, I love Morris dancers. Now, Not literally. When you read the sagas, you hear of a sunstone. Yes. I have a sunstone. What it is is Icelandic fluorospar. Yeah. And it only works with Icelandic fluorospar. I've got Mexican fluorospar, which doesn't work. And what it is, on a day like this, you hold up your fluoros bar and where you find the sun it forms a rainbow once you know where the sun is you can work out your direction that's very clever yeah and it's said that a princess found it on the seashore and would they have used the stars to navigate or would that oh yeah been too early there was a various things there they used the stars it's raining again and well, they, also, well, right? they also used to take soundings and what you do is you have your leg with lard in it drop it over the side and it comes up with whatever's on the bottom of the sea. Yeah, that's a good idea, yeah. yeah. They could also tell by the colour of the sea. Um, they could also see, if you've got lots of seagulls, sea birds, yeah. you know you're near land. In fact, in the Viking series, we've got a laven flocky. And what it was, laven flocky would go to sea with ravens. And when they, they would release the ravens, if they came back, they knew there's no land. And if the ravens didn't come back, then it's a chance there's land yeah. like that would have crashed into the sea. Fair Ravens enough. are highly intelligent birds. Uh, you can actually teach them to speak. Yeah, I've heard that. Mm. I don't know if you're allowed to keep them as a pet. No, I'm not sure about that. Mm. But they're certainly impressive looking uh, creatures. And you can certainly eat them if you want as well. Yeah, I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't. Raven pie. Especially, especially me. Uh, Ravens being my totem bird. Yeah, fair enough. But... Uh, yeah, navigation on that, and it's things that we don't know about anyway, you know, being, if you're a fisherman or a seaman of some yeah. description, maybe you'd know more, I mean, they could tell by the weather, and said the colour of the sea was a helpful Well, of thing. course so, I mean, all this information's passed mm. down, you know, generation to generation. Well, it's like the fishermen up in... Uh, we're, we're not Scotland. sailors, we're, we're, no. we're landlocked here, so... Well, we are further, furthest from the sea you can be in England. I think the nearest is with Skegness. Skegness, yeah, will be the nearest sea. Yeah, or be. Skeg Vegas, yeah. as they call it in Derby. I've never been, I'd like to go. Well, we'll go there one yeah. day. I don't think we'll make a video there. But I tell you, if you like the seaside in the, in the north, Whitby. The last time I went to uh, Skegness was with my brother David. And we spent all day looking for radioactive rocks on the beach. Well, he spent all day looking for radioactive rocks on the beach, and I just went to the chip shop and the pub. <laughs> well, if you want chips, Whitby. Whitby, oh, oh yeah. Oh, man, they've got a fossil beach. It's anything for everybody. You've got a fossil beach. If you like the Kiss Me Quick Hat and the ice cream, they've got that. Antique shops, they're loaded with Dracula. Them. Yeah, Dracula. And if you look at the monastery on the hill, the Vikings raided that. Yeah, we'll have to go there and mm. film there. Uh, fish and chips, the best in England, and I don't care what anybody says. I got a fish, I thought it was Moby Dick. Oh yeah, I can always remember that time when I came back from Derby, when I used to go clubbing. Mm. And it was about one in the morning, I went to a chippy, and they gave me a bag of chips that was like this. Yes, yeah, and, and I literally, I left a pile of chips from, from little over to little over. And for the next few days, I could just see these chips on the ground where I left them. Well, they had that many, they're yeah. massive. Well, they're probably getting rid of them. So well, they did they have chips, makes you think? We didn't have potatoes. No, so there you go. Well, you know, as I say, we... Maybe in Newfoundland they might have found one. <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing about the Vikings is, when you hear what they ate, it sounds revolting. It does do a degree. Dried fish. Yeah. Well, what you Lots do... Lots birds. You soak it in water for 24 hours. Then you get all the salt. Then you get wild garlic. Put that in the water. 
you've got a nice garlic and a bit of butter. Yeah. You've got a garlic, you've got a nice garlicky sauce to go with your fish. That to me sounds uh, rather nice. Yeah, but I suppose when you've been drinking mead all day, you don't really care what you eat. <laughs> well, they, it's like everybody else, and you eat as, as the best stuff you can. Well, of course you do. Um, you could go out, you hadn't got rabbits, but they had hares. Yes. You had deer. So would hair coursing be the thing? Yeah, yeah, that's what the, the, the greyhound dog is a Viking lord's dog. Well, of course so, yeah. Uh, the hair itself, you, I suppose, in Celtic mythology, the hair is sacred, which is why they were gasped when the Romans were munching down or say so of their gods. I'm always interested in the Celtic folk tales and some of the, like the uh, uh, folk tales from Finland, how they revolve we've, we've around animals more than people. It's always well, interesting. We, you have totem animals. And the hair w was sacred because it seemed as though they could disappear and reappear. They're actually very good at camouflage. I mean, when you consider the size of a hair, I don't know if you've seen one. Well, right? you are quite large. Yeah, it's like a size of a, a small. You get these really big ones as well. Yeah. Used to buy them when well, at Carsington when I was digging. All I saw was this big eye looking at me, and you can see why they thought they were. And the salmon was another uh, thing. Hello. That's just I'm always done to video. Uh, a video trip to Whitby would be great, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're definitely going to try that. It's a bit difficult for me at the moment to travel mm. because of my father. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I can only get away five afternoons a week, basically. Yeah. Well, Most of the time I'm caring. So we'll, we'll do it when things are settled. We're going to start travelling locally. There's loads of places locally we can cover mm. in a five hour trip. And then further afield. Well, Yorkshire is known as God's country. And when you go there, for the, those guys who yeah. haven't been, you'll see why. You wouldn't be saying that in Lancashire, though. York, <laughs> Lancashire, that's through the Civil is. War, uh, Rolls of the Roses. War of the Roses, yes. Uh, to be honest, the people of Lancashire, I think, were fantastic. I did a gig at Preston, and they were fantastic people. Oh, yeah. I was, when I was in the 69th Irish Regiment, there were a lot of them from Lancaster, and they were lovely people. I'll be what honest, great times. you could say that about most people. I slept one night in the dentist chair in that place. <laughs> I did, honestly. It's the only place I could sleep. Well, Fred did in the country, isn't it, Preston? Oh, well, yeah. Well, yeah. we're not. Yeah. yeah, we're 58 minutes in. Yeah, well. Carry on for a bit longer. So, as I say, uh, Whitby is a beautiful place. When I was a student, uh, what you did on a Saturday, you paid a fiver, and the bus would leave from the railway station at minute past nine, take you to Whitby, over the moors, where you've got Filingdales and all that, and then you end up in Whitby, and their bus would leave at a minute past six. So you had a nice day in York, in uh, Whitby, and I love York anyway, I'm biased. Yeah, fair enough, York is a wonderful place. But to our American friends, uh, if you're stuck at... London's great, I'm not dissing it, but it's so big. It is very big. But York is a... Uh, I love it. And there's actually down Gillygate a chip shop where the actor Charles Bronson used to go with oh, right, yeah. his wife Jill Island. <laughs> and if you go to that chip shop, on the wall there's pictures of Charles Bronson and Jill Island and they've signed them. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I mean, what a great actor he was. Yeah, and he used to come every year and he would go specifically to this chip shop in Gillygate. Uh, another place we're not, is Chester. I like Chester. I have a brother who lives in Chester. Very nice well, place. Helps me in Paul. Uh, I went there as a child. And there's some beautiful uh, walls around there. Hello, what did uh, I say? Well, Thorbert's having to sign off now, so goodbye, Thorbert. See you, Thorbert. Thank you for hanging around yeah. with us. I suppose I've been being around a bit longer, well, um, but we're no doubt we'll catch up in the future. We'll be slipping back into the And we still have first. three people watching. Good. And we, we like live streams. Mm. We should have done a bit more live streams in the past, but we just found it a, bit, a little bit difficult. <laughs> well, Chester is a great place. Uh, I remember as a child, and they've still got them, these windows. Instead of this being straight like that, they curve in. Yeah. And you think there's no glass in the windows. Mm. But I went there. There's an excellent museum in Chester. Uh, for those who smoke, there's a great uh, tobacconist as well. Yeah, there is, yes. Uh, but a the, rare thing. Yeah, and the walls are mostly intact, and they've got antique shops on it and everything. Uh, but Chester is a beautiful place. Um, resurrected by Queen Athelflaed, by the way. Oh, right, I didn't know. Yeah, yeah I it's didn't a, know that, I forgot that. It's a Roman city. Yes. But it was in ruins when Athelflaed came, and now it's a, a, a big city. 
Liverpool is a good place to be as well. Yes, I like Liverpool. Uh, a big hi to my friend Max and Rowan. Uh, hope to see you soon. Liverpool is fantastic. I love it. We get the wrong impression that people give it a negative view. It's not like that at all. Well, no, the, the buildings there are just you know, fabulous. Their museums, are, I went to, I did the Wakamaka Splash here. Oh, yeah. Which is a World War II yellow duck uh, amphibious vehicle. I yeah, don't care I've whether it's cliche. It's freezing cold, but we went along the river, along the easy, and I saw the registrar office where John Lennon got married, the entrance to Chinatown, very impressive. And people, there are some marvellous restaurants in your, in um, Liverpool. Everyone has a pride. Too. One thing about Liverpool is the people have a pride in their place that you don't see anywhere else. Oh yeah, I just love the accent I do. It's also a friendly place as well. That's right mate. But um, there's good shops there as well. Uh, I was on the Royal Dock. <coughs> I was with the only couple who didn't like the Beatles because I'd like to. How can you in. not like the Beatles well, unless they like Rolling Stones more? Well, whatever. There's also other than a museum of slavery, which I would like to have gone in. Yeah, I didn't know that. But and of course, that's the subject we talked about. Yeah, hasn't it? modern art subjects as well. This is all on the Royal Dock, but you go up the hill, and the local radio is right at the top of the tower. You've got the lives of birds and everything else. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. So, anyway, uh, I've babbled on about Liverpool, York, Chester. It's, uh, I just love England. I think it's a wonderful I, country. I was trying to think of that place in Kent. Well, I can't remember the name of it. Town. Rochester? Well, not Rochester, no. I was born there. I know a song about that. Um, mm -hmm. It's got a Roman, it's got a big fort in the middle of it. and it's St Albans? No, not St Albans. Uh, uh, it's near Clapton-on-Sea. I don't know, I know Canterbury, my grandfather. Yeah, we'll talk about that next time mm. and I remember where it is and what, what it is. There's <laughs> another one, Canterbury. Uh, now, you're going to hear the martyrdom of Thomas Beckett. It is Thomas a Beckett. There's no A ah in it at all. It will right be calling me Egil Abramsko. Yeah. It doesn't happen. Um, but it's well worth a visit again. Uh, I'm always reminded of my late friend because uh, he sandbagged the Prince of Black Prince on the way to D-Day. Um, you know, I always remember Arthur when I see that. But again, another beautiful place to go. Take your wallet with you, it's a bit pricey, like York. But well worth a visit. And we've got some more questions. Yes, yeah, so we'll quick look. I would like to go to England just to try the addition Ewell's like, original bitter. Oh yes, like English mead. We know a lot about beer. Who was that? I, don't, it's a, I didn't quite see the names I was reading in the comment, and it's a pity I don't have my TV on. I, I could have sort of gone back and saw it. But I think it's a new uh, subscriber or somebody yeah. new on the channel. So, hello and welcome. Yeah, great well, to I see you say, here. Uh, I assume you're from abroad. so if I you... think they're American and saying that they'd love to go to England. Yeah. Well, if you are coming to England, let us know. Yes. And we'll take you around the pubs of Derby. Yeah, or even to Burton. Well, the capital of beer in the world. Hey, Burton. <laughs> now, uh, I was thinking of the uh, dolphin. The, the dolphin, yeah. And the seven stars. I'll go down there, I'll be two pound a pint there. It's nice. And <laughs> seven stars. That's about three dollars a pint. Yeah, but uh, yeah, Burton is a great, brilliant place. It's more industrial. Yes. It's got a nice town hall and library. I was a bit disparaging because I actually worked in Burton and. They work it's so a nice hard. place, but it, it just needs a lot of work doing to it, and not, there's not been enough investment over the years, despite the massive beer industry they have there. They've got a very big industrial unit, Boots are there, you've got, uh, there's various other firms as well. You know, massive warehouses that supply the shops. I mean, they, they do a lovely IPA, um, Indian Pale Ale. And uh, I like to go to the Bridge Inn, because the Bridge Inn actually used the original well, it's the Burton Bureau we used to use. And that's very, very pure water. That's oh, lovely. I'm not a great beer drinker. I drink Guinness, Newcastle Brown, but mostly I prefer wine or brandy. Because Newcastle Brown is where to say, and I'm going out to see a man about a dog comes from. Yes, it's dog, they call it. Yeah. It? But I can drink that, but actually, you remember that time we went uh, went to a show and uh, we had real ale? I had yeah. half of it, and then the rest to me tasted like sweat, and I was, poured it on the ground. Was that an antiques fair? Yeah. Uh, that was where I got my... Yeah, some of your medals. Yeah. 
because you look very bemused because I go into medal mode. Well, he loves his medals. I just switch off and it's folk, and I, I have to apologise before and because I just went off like a rocket. Nah, that's fine. I mean, these live streams, yeah. you know, can be any random subject, you know. Well, I mean, I I must admit, you know, we sat down in the tent and I I drank half of it and offered the rest. Yeah. I had to throw it on the ground because it, it just. Well, that's the oh. problem with ale and beer, is that it, it can take a long time to find a real nice ale. And you know when you've got a nice ale, because it's a kind of ale and pint which you pick up and you drink in one go because it's so nice. Well, if you go to Nottingham, the trip to Jerusalem, that uh, claims to be the oldest pub in Britain, and I should think it's pretty close. Because it wasn't called that back in the day, was it? No, it was, t- it was found in about 1200. Yes, yeah, it was. Yeah. 1200. Well, if you go there, they do excellent food, but also sample beers. I went with my mate Rob and there were three samples of beer you could buy. Well, not this year, but next year they should be doing the Robin Hood Festival oh, at, yeah. at the uh, Nottingham Castle. So I think we might go and try to get into that and do a tour of it and then we can finish up doing a little tour of the uh, trip to Jerusalem. Mm. It's a very well, nice old pub. Anybody visiting Nottingham, well worth going to the trip to Jerusalem. Well, I'll always go there. There's, a, there's a ship in a box, glass box, and an it's never been cleaned because anybody who cleans it dies. I think the last time you, you were probably there, it was lots more. But since that, they found some more caves and yeah, made it a bit bigger. It took us about two or three years ago. But they've got the game where you have a chain with a ring and a horn out the wall. Yeah, I got, I got that yeah, one upstairs. I've got them the bag of tow, is it? I don't no, know. But I, get I like to go at it. It's good fun. I like the, the pub where you can go and play skittles in a pub. Devil Among the Tailors, yeah. that's called, where it's on the chain. But it makes you think, you know, back in the dark ages, there you are in your long house, mm. you've got all your friends over, you've got a few barrels of mead, what kind of games would they have played? Well, you know, there's the drinking from the horn, which yeah. I've left, my, I've put mine away. We used to do the spinning around yeah. the spear until you got dizzy. And also there was, this is where the yard of ale comes from, Yeah. You drink it, and you get the airlock and whoosh. I can't drink a, pi- uh, more, a pint of ale. Well, I went out and had uh, five pints here today, lovely. That's more than me. Yeah. But, uh, five pints about my limit. I like a bottle of wine, white wine, and red wine. I like That's a rosy around. wine. I like brandy as well. Well, yes, I'll yeah. give you some every week. Yeah. That'll be reserved for Christmas. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> it makes me last that long. Yeah, well, it makes you also think <laughs> about the availability of stuff they could buy <clears> that the day, you know. I have to tell you. Bad news, I drunk that brandy you gave me. Oh, uh, well, I thought it wouldn't last very long. Yeah, that was a good, good drop, that was. But, well, it's uh, very old as well. Yeah, so am I. Am <laughs> I not that old? Yeah, but it was a good drink. Uh, what did I say? That's about all of him, isn't it? Uh, any more questions? Uh, well, if you've got any more questions uh, you want to ask us while we're here, live, on yeah. YouTube, well, I've um, gone please through do so. Down there. Well, have you gone through the list? Of, uh, well, that's I've all pe- I've content. I've done uh, Valhalla Rising. Yeah, yeah. well, we're going to do a video on that soon. Uh, it's a very good film. Yeah, it's like I say, if you've got children. I think the main uh, trailers we're going to review next are the series trailers for The Last Kingdom and The Vikings, mm. which will be in total about eight or nine videos. Is that Bernard Cornwall who did The Last Kingdom? Uh, it, no, I think it might be based on some of his books. Yeah. I, f- I forget now. I'm not I, saw, I, and I remember seeing the video a thousand AD. The last book I bought was the uh, uh, Game of Thrones book. So I'd really love that. to see the Game of Thrones. And it's Fantastic fun. series. Well, the funny thing was, I was staying with a friend of mine in Crystal Palace, mm. and she would fast forward all the sex scenes, so it looked like pornographic Yeah, there is a lot Hill. of sex scenes in it. Well, well it looked like pornographic yeah. Benny Hill. Well, that's Hollywood for you. That's, that's, you know, I don't sex- mind it. Well, I don't think it does. And, well, uh, well you, it's, it's not acceptable if you're below 18, because then it makes it you know, a, bit, a bit restricted. Well, I'm a little past 18. Yeah, yeah well, it, well, you know, Game of Thrones is such a, a brilliant series, and it's really gripping. You're either going to like it or not like it, and the characters in it are very strong. And you can see the influence of the Vikings and whatnot, and mm. the Saxons, and, and our history as well. Because often in life, you know, like... Uh, they're talking, I mean, it's all plagiarism, it's all based on older stuff, so... Well, I remember we went to a pub and there was a guy from Eastern Europe. He said, what's your favourite program? Gametronis. What? Gametronis. And it turns out it means Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones, ah. Oh. Uh, it's a nice one. It's a, it's a pity that the, the last series, they shortened the episode. I couldn't tell you. Because I, 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 I think that really is a big mistake, and they, they're trying to rush the end now. 
and it's going to be a gripping end. I don't know what's going to happen because I've not read the books. I don't well, want to know. I've got the first one where Sean Bean has his head chopped yeah. off. And there's a blonde haired kid. Well, that's traditional for Sean Bean to die in vid films. And there's a short chap uh, and a blonde haired kid. I think if you go to, if you type in YouTube, uh, Sean Bean death scenes, you'll see a lot of them. <laughs> well, what a great actor Sean Bean is. I mean, I was watching uh, Sharp the other day. And, you know, it's not really age that series. It's just good now as it is then. Yeah, I, I've got a problem with that, but never mind. Well, what's your problem with Sharp? Uh, the fact that a private ends up as a colonel. Yeah, uh, yeah. A, the Duke of Wellington would never have done that. But well, probably not. Having said that, it's a good en entry into it. Well, you know, if it was some kind of uh, high-class person in the first place, it, it would not have made the same series. Well, it's interesting that the Rifle Brigade that's shown is actually based on Belper in Derbyshire. Uh, it was formed. The Belper Yeoman, Yeoman yeah, Army? it was formed after the Napoleonic Wars, but they wore green uniforms and had favoured men. Now, if you go out of Belper towards Ambergate, you'll see the the bots, and that's where they first started um, target practice. Yes, was used up to the Second World War. They went out of favour then for a time in the fifties, early sixties. Um, so I can't remember what the name number of the regiment was. But they were sharpshooters. Yes, yeah, the green is a typical for a sharpshooter. Mm. I, I have a very good friend of mine called Paul. He runs the first United States sharpshooters in the American Civil War Society. I don't think he's been watching this, but hello, we are. And they dress in green. And if you were caught as a sharpshooter in the Civil War, you would have been automatically shot because they thought of it as non gentleman warfare. Well, uh, that was a classic case, wasn't it? The Confederates had Whitworth rifles. Yeah, they did, yes. And the general saying, He's up, boys. They couldn't hit an elephant and was shot dead. Yeah, but there, there are so many different types of rifles brought yeah. in the war. You, you couldn't list them all. No. And also the amount of fraud in the American Civil War with buying rifles. Rifles that didn't basically work. And they would sell them at a high rate, get a lot of money and basically defraud the US government. Which is why the Gatling gun wasn't taken up as eagerly as it should have been. No, well, it should have been. Well... The Whitworth rifle, you could tell the bullet was hexagonal, wasn't it? Mm, I can't remember that. It was an odd shape. Yeah, it may have been. I can't remember the general's name. If you know, he was shot accidentally by, well, it wasn't accidental. It was a Confederate sniper. Well, no, because they have fired a, a sharp uh, rifle, and they have a, a guillotine where mm. they cut off the black powder. So you have a tube of black powder with you shot in it, although naturally in reenactment you don't fire rounds. But just fired a black powder and it basically guillotines the back off so the powder's revealed. Mm. A fascinating well, system. The rifle used by the Belper rifleman would be the Baker rifle. Yeah. Uh, it took longer to load but was far more accurate. Just uh, imagine Vikings and Saxon with guns, my gosh. Well, the thing that amazes me, gunpowder's been around for well, it has a been thousand around. years and that it never left China until. Well, well that was the salt road. I mean, the salt road had a massive influence on that. Well, they had hand grenades before the Chinese well, the, got it. Well, yeah. We found that, uh, shards, clay shards with burning in them, and they did experiments and found out, hey, boys, this is an ex a hand grenade. So, yeah. Yeah, well, it, it's the, it, it was the rise and the availability of black powder that basically killed off the salt road, because yeah. it made it virtually impassable during the middle section of it, mm. uh, in, in Mongolia around that yeah. area. Um, so it had a massive influence. There's a very good TV series on at the moment touring the Salt Road. I'm sorry if I'm leaning forward because my back's aching. One of the biggest uh, exports they would look for uh, along the uh, Salt Road was pigeon droppings mm. because they collected the pigeon droppings and they would have manufactured that with some of the ingredients, which I won't tell you, into black powder. Yeah, they also used urine, didn't they? They did use Aluminium urine. Aluminium sulfate. Because it, it, when. If you are a novice and you're using a musket, and what a novice will do, someone who's green, you can always tell a novice because they'll have a big black mouth. Because when they bite the round off, they bite them too much, and they'll get a bit of black powder in your mouth, and it does taste mm. like urine. Mm. It's got that taste and smell yeah. to it. Um, so they, they would collect urine because the aluminium sulfate was uh, a component. Saltpeters. Because during the Napoleonic Wars, you used to donate urine for the troops to make, you know, gunpowder for the troops. Oh, yes. Um, but, yeah. But, you know, the, the supply lines must have been fast. Yeah. Well, yeah. I just imagine if, if that technology reached the dark ages, what, what difference it would have made. Yeah, well, but it didn't. 
you know, I prefer the Fjord and the Sphere and the Act, me personally. It's, it's a closer form of combat, although more bloodier. So, any more questions before we leave and end this live stream? We've been going for one minute, ten, one minute and ten. One hour, ten minutes. No, so. <laughs> I'll, I'll be in the ice cream all night and nobody like whole Riley's Well, how did you find it talking on your own then? Easy. Yeah, so you, it's, it's good, so you can do more live streams on your own in the future. I you? put my foot in there, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, I will yeah. be doing like, live streams on my own, and I, I, I could have done some by now, uh, but I, I, I not felt comfortable doing any well, yet. it's not a problem, because you've got to, your dad is needs to look Yeah, at, uh, I, I've got to keep that balance. Yeah. But what I'll be doing in live streams is probably sewing some hats and stuff together, huh. and then just talking to you, yeah. you know, because I'm pretty certain I can talk and sew at the same time. As long as you set up your TV and things, and I can yeah. answer, uh, no problemo. And I might do some uh, live streams telling some of the folk tales I know, uh, you know, so... Well, that'll be something in the future. Yeah, I think I've got no more to say. Any questions? No, no questions coming in. Okay then. Well, I think at this point we're going to end the live stream. As yeah. I've got to get Eggle back home at some point. I, I turn into a pumpkin. Well, technically he should be walking home, but I'm going to give him a lift. Not heard that from me. <laughs> That's well, not evidence now. I've walked here, so. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, oh, uh, thanks for the live stream, and that was Kent Martin. So, hello, Kent Martin. Hi, Kent. Um, I've like seen you on the channel before, so welcome. Yeah, welcome. Uh, if you're not subscribed, then please do so. Um, I may not be getting the vlog out today, as I've got, to, I've got to edit it after this video. This can take some time. The editing process is very short. Uh, have a good evening, everyone. Well, we certainly will do. Thank we'll be you. both having a shandy and something nice to eat, like mm. steak. So, hi, hello, hello, Kent. Hello, Kent. Great name. Yeah. Well, I remember steak. Mm, well, well, we'll get you some steak one night when we up round here. Oh dear. Yes. So. Okay then. But for now, just a goodbye. Yeah. Bye here. We'll see you in the next live stream. And if you want to check out our playlist of live streams, then I think it's in this one over here. You have got to point in the opposite direction. <laughs> it's confusing. I know. And I'll put that playlist if I remember. And remember, steak. Thank you.